Um, and then a little bit later, we had uh, Wittgenstein saying, well, um, it's not about uh, logic, but it's about entering into a form of life. So religion is a form of life, and you can only understand it within that particular form of life. So religion had started to move away from reason uh, into other ways of justifying itself. And the major figure here, I think, is uh, this gentleman, Martin Heidegger, uh, a German philosopher who studied first under Husserl, who was the founder of phenomenology, and then um, took over Husserl's chair at the University of Torda. Um, a, an ambiguous figure, he had a, a, a dodgy relationship with the uh, Nazis, at one stage he joined the Nazi party, and he certainly, uh, unlike Bonhoeffer, who stood up against the Nazis and ended up dead, uh, Heidegger didn't stand up against the Nazis and ended up surviving the war, um, surviving to 76, what's that, 80, 87 years old or something like that. Okay, and Heidegger was the guy who invented this term auto theology that we're going to get into. So what Heidegger did was to engage on a critique of traditional metho metaphysics and he called traditional metaphysics onto theology which for him encapsulated all that was wrong with traditional metaphysics. So what he said was that in the past metaphysics had focused on what is, which for those of you who do philosophy is the, the, the discipline of ontology. Okay, fasten. Focused on what is, what exists, what beings there are. Uh, and he said that this study of what beings existed led inevitably to them being put in a hierarchy and it ended up with there being a supreme being which was God. So traditional metaphysics, because of its focus on beings and what beings they were and the, the, the order between them, ended up um, delivering a concept of God as a supreme being. Which, and of course the, subject, the study of God is theology, so the study of ontology leads to the study of theology, so we get onto theology, and that's all the term means. It's not an arcane concept at all. Um, so Heidegger had, having analysed uh, the, the malaise, what we call the, the malaise of, of modern philosophy, as being to do with this concentration on, on being, rather on beings, existing things rather than being itself with a capital B. Um, he had a number of criticisms of this. First of all, uh, by having a rational God, the God of the philosophers, a God that was established by philosophers, it took the whole mystery out of the concept of God and the concept of religion. Uh, it made it too logical and he wanted a bit of mystery back in it. Um, it gave us a very cold, uh, logical conception of God. God as the prime mover. Um, God as the uh, creator of himself. It wasn't a very uh, amenable God, you know, and it wasn't the sort of God, God the prime mover, this is sort of ethereal, philosophical concept of a God. It wasn't the sort of God that you would want to pray to, that you would want to sing hymns to, that you would want to... Um, uh, worship in any way because it was too cold and intellectual. Um, so the Ponto theology gave us a, a, a very unattractive uh, type of God. Um, and ultimately Ponto theology opened the, the way for science to dominate because it was based on logic and reason and eventually logic and reason took over and God but put to one side. And as we've mentioned, the most important thing for Heidegger was that ontotheology 
the idea of studying beings, distracted us from the real question. And for Heidegger, the real question was the nature of being, with a capital B, uh, which he said must be retrieved in order to renew philosophy and make it alive again. Quote from Being in Time, which was his most famous book, because metaphysics requires about beings, as beings remains concerned with beings and does not devote itself to being as being. So what Heidegger was concerned was, was what is being with a capital B itself? Uh, little comment about ontotheology. It's been a very popular word in theological circles for the last uh, 50 years or so, 60 years. And uh, this is uh, Merle Westphal, who's a, one of them on um, theologians. So the term is often used by assistant professors who have appointed themselves as campus theorists in the last, by senior scholars who should be more careful as a kind of sci-fi conceptual zapper. You aim it at any theology archaic enough to affirm a transcendent personal creator and vaporize it by intoning the magic word onto the theology. So, and, and you'll find this same tendency in a number of the critics of Dawkins and Hitchens and, and uh, Harris Siddell. Um, you'll find the word onto theology used in exactly this way as a derisive, um, derogative term by which they think they can just dismiss all the arguments of what did um, Terry Eagleton call Ditchkins. Did anybody heard uh, Terry Eagleton's Terry lectures at um, Yale and he lumps Hitch, Hitchens and, uh, and Dawkins together under the, under the uh, generic name of Ditchkins and proceeds to Pour all his scorn on them, as is his one. He's got a very good line of scorn, scorn Terry Eagleton. I don't know if you've read him, but he, uh, he's worth reading just because of his command of invective. He's wrong on almost everything, but he's worth reading. Okay, so Heidegger's question was, what is being? And this is what I call the ontological delusion. Uh, and the ontological delusion comes um, about because of a series of what I see as false moves in uh, logical thinking. And it's a series of false moves where you take an ordinary word um, and you nominalise it, you make it into a noun. Then the next step is reification, which is to make it into something real. So a noun is just a grammatical category. We have lots of things that are nouns that don't represent real things. They represent abstract qualities, such as like greenness, for example. Nobody imagines there's a thing called greenness. There are green things. But it's useful to have a noun uh, for it, called greenness. But it's not useful to then um, make out that greenness is a real thing. And the third, third step in this downward slide towards um, incomprehensibility is to capitalise it, uh, as Heidegger does with being. Um, so, for example, if you take the word lumpy, um, then you can talk about lumpiness. Uh, I was worried about the lumpiness of my pillow, for example, which just means that the, it was lumpy, um, and it can be a useful way of talking. But then, if you decide that lumpiness is a real thing, you know, um, the trouble with the world is there's too much lumpiness creeping in. Um, and you could even have a theory that the whole world is, 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 is made of lumpiness. You know, everything we know is lumpy. There are very few smooth surfaces, if any, if you get down to the microscopic and submicroscopic level. It's all lumpy. So lumpiness is, in fact, the thing that's running the whole world. And that's the sort of nonsense that you can get to if you go through these three stages. Um, you take a word like different, two things are different. And it's often useful to talk about the difference, to normalise, make it into a noun. 
and we can say, you know, the, the difference between these two things, etc. So. But then we get into the difficult territory when we start thinking about difference as a, as a real thing, as a quality. And then finally, we uh, capitalise it, and in the case of difference, we also put it into French, um, which is a fourth step which makes it even more uh, portentous and significant. If something is written in French, it must be important. Um, you have uh, uh, film buffs talk about montage as though it's something really you know, key, but it's actually just the French word for editing, you know. Um, and, but if they said editing, it wouldn't sound nearly as good as montage. And so this is what um, Heidegger does with the humble verb to be. Is. Something is. <coughs> we can normalise it. We can talk about being. With a lot of verbs, the noun form is in fact the uh, present participle, the gerund, for those who be grammatical model. Um, and it's useful to talk about beings and, and uh, uh, without um, wanting to, to make too much of it. But then what happens is that you start to think about being as something that things have. And, uh, and you put it, give it a capital B and make it even more pretentious and you are in big philosophical trouble. And this is uh, Heidegger's problem. And it's the problem with a lot of modern philosophy. If you go back to it and want to sort of re-examine some of the concepts. People have taken consciousness as another one, somebody's conscious, so we have this thing, consciousness, which is a useful term to talk about. But then we put a capital C on it and say the hard problem of consciousness. And as though consciousness is a thing, but there's no such thing as consciousness. There are people who are conscious. Uh, but people, huge amounts of um, people being worried about what consciousness is. Consciousness isn't anything, it's just that some people are conscious, some aren't, some more than others, etc. etc. Okay, so Heidegger's big, big question what is being itself? Okay, um, now I'm arguing on the basis of some of what I've said before and what I'm going to say now that this is what I call a, an illegitimate question. Not everything that can be posed in the form, grammatical form of a question, is a legitimate, legitimate question. Um, it may be uh, illegitimate in various ways, um, but the most common way um, is that it has invalid assumptions. And the classic case of this, of course, is the lawyer's question, have you stopped beating your wife? Um, that assumes it's got... It, for most people, I hope everybody here, it's got invalid assumptions. Um, it only is a valid question if it's addressed to somebody who has got a wife and somebody who has been beating her. Uh, and so if somebody says, have you stopped beating your wife? Um, if those, neither of those assumptions are true, that's an illegitimate question. It's a question that doesn't have an answer. It looks like a question, but it's not really a question. And the same applies to the, uh, the same applies to Heidegger's question. He's saying, what is being, the capital B? Well, any question in the form of what, it, what is X has two assumptions. First of all, it assumes there's something called X. And secondly, it assumes that X can be described or defined or classified in terms of qualities and concepts and so on. So, it's, just, it's, it's making those two assumptions. 